welcome back to our series of lectures. As you probably know, the Elizabeth Seton Lectures were instituted 12 years ago by the Sisters of Charity. And over that period of time, we've had uh, some very prominent theologians as our speakers. Uh, and of course, this year we continue that tradition. And although our speaker this time uh, comes to us from uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, New Jersey, he is a native son. He was born and brought up in New Glasgow and uh, did his first degrees at Acadia University. And he was uh, ordained by the African uh, Baptist Association and served as a pastor and then as a traveling secretary for the Christian student movement, both in Canada and Nigeria. He's well acquainted, of course, with our homeland, and he has much experience of social issues and black churches in particular in the United States. Um, there is a brochure uh, up uh, above that you can pick up, and there's a biography, a brief biography of Dr. Peter Paris on the back. Um, if you have read it or uh, will read it, you'll notice that uh, he has held a, a variety of teaching positions uh, in a number of universities and uh, theological schools in the United States. And he has published numerous articles and books and has served as consultant for important uh, church bodies related to uh, social ethical issues. Uh, Dr. Paris last night spoke to us about Christianity and social justice. And he spoke about and out of uh, the black experience, particularly relating the black churches to social issues. And this morning he's going to speak to us uh, concerning uh, the importance of voluntary associations in the quest for social justice. And this afternoon at 2 o'clock uh, he will pursue this uh, same issue uh, under the heading Comparative Struggles for Racial Justice in the United States, Canada, and South Africa. It's with great pleasure that I reintroduce our speaker to the podium, Dr. Peter Paris. Good morning. Thank you very much, Professor Whedon, for your warm introduction. It's an honor for me to be here um, and to address you this morning on this, um, this subject, <clears throat> on the importance of voluntary associations in the quest for social justice. Voluntary associations are essential marks of a democracy. Unlike the two natural associations of family and state, voluntary associations imply the experience of public freedom and individual choice. The striking novelty associated with the so-called democratic experiment in the United States was the ubiquitous function of the voluntary association throughout the society. In the 1830s, a journalist from France, Alexis de Tocqueville, came to the United States in order to spend a year traveling around trying to understand and to describe this novel experiment. That is the experiment of democracy American style. And so he wrote, and I, I quote uh, in the 1830s, in no other country in the world has the principle of association been more successfully used or applied to a greater multitude of objects than in the United States. The citizen of the United States is taught from infancy to rely upon his own exertions in order to resist the evils and the difficulties of life. He looks upon the social authorities 
with an eye of mistrust and anxiety, and he claims its assistance only when he is unable to do without it. This habit may be traced even in the schools, where the children in their games are wont to submit to rules which they have themselves established and to punish misdemeanors which they have themselves defined. In the United States, associations are established to promote the public safety, commerce, industry, morality, and religion. That's the end of the quote. All of this was very new and strange to a person like de Tocqueville. De Tocqueville concluded that everything in, the, in America was voluntary, including its religion. And that was a most surprising discovery for him since the spirit of freedom that expressed itself in the French Revolution had not extended to religion, which continued to enjoy its status of transcendence over the state, in contrast to the separation of church and state that eventually developed in the United States. Hence, de Tocqueville admitted surprise in his discovery that you meet a politician every time you meet a priest in the United States because the priest must, in the United States, must rely on the art of persuasion rather than mere authority as the first principle of leadership. Um, because the people would resist simply um, a person saying, you ought to believe this or you ought to do it simply because I say so or simply because some higher authority says so. One rather has to persuade the people through um, a moral argument. More importantly, the voluntary principle implied an egalitarian society permitting no entitlements of, governments, of governance to political, social, or religious elites. Rather, individual choice would govern all associational relations. In other words, the freedom of individuals to choose both their political and religious associations relativize the traditional authority of both, and hence grounded both in an understanding of humanity that was heavily indebted to the philosophy of the Enlightenment. The primacy of the voluntary principle in associational life subjects all authority to the will of the people. When institutionalized, this principle presupposes the conditions of freedom of speech, of association, and of religious practice. Hence, freedom of the press, freedom to vote on all public matters, freedom to function on juries, and freedom of worship are the essential rights of all citizens in a democratic state. Inevitably, this has contributed to the development of an ethos in American society that is suspicious of every authority at best and tacit rejection of those that are not subject to the will of the people. The rise of political parties and of religious denominations rather than an established church are expressive of this voluntary principle. Certain economic philosophies, bureaucratic and military procedures, as well as certain ecclesial traditions are constantly in tension with this type of freedom whenever called upon to justify 
their authority or their heteronomy. Clearly, every form of external governance abhors dissent and must rely on some form of effective coercion in order to maintain itself. In the interest of control, dissent is usually always illegitimate. That is, when the system is governed from outside by external authority, it usually allows for no le legitimate dissent. Um, I like using the military as a good example of this. It is very difficult in the military to dissent legitimately. Well, that writ large is an example of external um, uh, control or the lack of a democratic principle of governance. Under such conditions, all social reform must be initiated from the top down. And in society, this means from the ruling classes. This type of leadership from the top down kills imagination and creativity and takes responsibility away from those who are ruled. That is, the responsibility lies in the seat of authority, but not in those who are ruled. Those who are ruled are viewed by the top authorities as either innocent or rebellious. I suppose they could be if they're, if they're very obedient, that's where um, their innocence occurs. And they are viewed as innocent, or if they are less obedient, then they are rebellious. Hence, the rate of social change is necessarily very slow. Democratic governance, on the other hand, encourages its people to be continuously vigilant concerning public affairs and to exercise their freedom of speech and of association in initiating social criticism and through the art of persuasion generate public support and action. And so in a democratic situation, that's why a press, a free press, is so essential because a free press is an opportunity for the people to pass commentary on whatever they choose to comment on. And that becomes the institutionalization of the criticism. And if you don't really have um, a free press or if you don't have any press at all, then it's very difficult to pass criticism on what is happening in the public sphere. The starting point for democratic social change is the discontent of some people relative to a felt issue which in turn leads them to expend their energy to bring this felt issue to public visibility. You see, you first of all have got to have some experience or some feeling about an issue. But that isn't sufficient to bring about social change. You then have got to take this feeling about the issue and find a way of giving it public visibility in order for this felt issue to become a public issue. And hence, 
the creation of a public issue goes through this kind of a process. That is, one supported by a plurality of people acting together for its effective resolution. Such cooperative activity comprises the purpose of voluntary associations, even though it must be noted that social change is not always the aim of voluntary associations. On the contrary, the purposes of voluntary associations may be infinite, ranging from those that are strictly private and professional in purpose to those that are bent on supporting and promoting some form of the status quo, to say nothing of those that seek to prevent others from sharing some benefit or right. That is, you can form a voluntary association for any purpose that you like, and that those purposes are not always good and just purposes. In short, voluntary associations do not exhibit a common moral ethos. The common characteristic of all is people, of all voluntary associations, is people organizing their own groups for their own purposes. And in this respect, voluntary associations represent manifest freedom. They serve to protect the rights of all to dissent and to mobilize public support for their dissent. Respect for pluralistic perspectives on public issues inheres in the voluntary principle. It is evident, however, that leadership from the bottom up constantly threatens social coherence and social order. And that's why when you have a situation of leadership from the top down, the top is always interested in maintaining social order and coherence and unity and sees dissent as very problematic. And it, they're right, dissent is problematic because it is always entails some kind of, of threat to the order because it's, it's trying to bring about some change uh, in the social order. And thus their strong affirmation of pluralism implies strong support for social conflict on public matters. And if you believe in voluntary associations, then you believe in the importance of conflict on social matters, differences of opinion and different forms of action vis-a-vis -vis those opinions. Unfortunately, the experience of freedom has not always been available to all groups even in a democratic society, and especially one like the United States. For one half century, following the period of Reconstruction, the majority of African Americans living in the former states of the old Confederacy were systematically disfranchised and socially oppressed by law and customary practice. And this was following three and a half centuries of slavery, the worst type of slavery that the world has known because it was inherited slavery. Much of slavery in the world prior to its appearance in the United States was slavery for one generation, but that people yet unborn 
were not viewed as slaves. So inherited slavery is what made this such a terrible, terrible system. So after three and a half years of that, necessitating a civil war to bring an end to slavery, the former slaves enjoyed a brief period of about 12 years of freedom during what was called the Reconstruction Period. And then through various political maneuvers, the Reconstruction Era ended, and that allowed the southern states, the former states of the Confederacy, to then establish in law and custom a system of second-class citizenship, where the vote was taken away from blacks, and they were economically and socially oppressed uh, in addition. Now these conditions lasted until the, the Martin Luther King uh, uh, civil rights movement in the 1950s and the 1960s. These and similar conditions strongly militated against viable associational life of any kind among African Americans in those states. Churches and selected other organizations were permitted to exist as long as they posed no threat to the social order and its customs. And you will note that during the decade of the Civil Rights Movement, in the 1950s and the 1960s, that many churches, many black churches, were bombed, and particularly the one in Birmingham, 16th Street Baptist Church, where four little girls were killed while in Sunday school because of the bombing. But many, many other churches and homes of black ministers and some few white ministers were bombed as well. So that these were viewed, that is homes and churches, normally viewed as no threat to the social order. When the people in these homes and these churches began threatening the social order, then, the, then various groups of people had no qualms whatsoever about planting bombs in those homes and in those churches. I mean, this is serious business. It was not uncommon for the legal and judicial authorities to ban certain groups when they failed to live up to the expectations of the white majority. Legal controls were assisted by the vigilante activity of the Ku Klux Klan, a constant source of terrorist threat. In spite of these many strictures, however, the Montgomery Improvement Association, in close alliance with the black churches, emerged in 1956 in the heart of the old Alabama Confederacy for the purpose of challenging the laws and customs of racial segregation and discrimination. That association was the precursor of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference called into existence in 1957 by Martin Luther King, Jr. Both of these voluntary associations were supported morally and financially by many from outside of the environs of the southern states. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers relied heavily on the US, the United States Supreme Court and the Attorney General's office for supportive leadership and worked diligently 
to persuade Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy to act decisively in support of the goals of racial justice. Eventual leadership from Presidents Kennedy and Johnson provided the much desired legitimation from both the executive and the congressional branches of government. But it should not be supposed that their support, even the support of Kennedy, came quickly or easily, contrary to the mythology that has developed since Kennedy's assassination. But Kennedy really didn't know anything about blacks, very, very little, when he first came into office. And then as he gradually came to know about blacks and about their struggle and to sympathize with them, he was very reluctant to act because weighing the political consequences, it became clear that to act in various ways of support for Martin Luther King and what he was about would very well have uh, negative political consequences. And so that was an overriding factor in the, uh, the, the slow pace of support that came um, from the administration. But it eventually did come because the administration kept open the doors of communication with the, with the civil rights movement. But at the same time, the FBI and the CIA were militantly trying to under, uh, undermine the civil rights movement and to threaten the president as well. These are very complex. This is a very complex story. And uh, many uh, books have been written uh, from various perspectives, trying to set out the nature of this kind of complexity. But let us not suppose that the presidents of the United States or the Congress um, acted quickly. And when they finally did act, uh, it was in the midst of great pressure. And finally, when I'm not finally in my lecture yet, but it. <laughs> Uh, but on that same note, uh, even when uh, the decision was made by Congress um, uh, almost 20 years after Martin Luther King's death to have a national holiday, then it was abundantly clear to everybody in the nation that President Ronald Reagan signed that bill against his own private uh, wishes. He did not want to sign it and had made that clear, but finally did. And that was, uh, was a significant uh, as well, but also consistent with the whole tenor of, um, of that struggle. Clearly, moral legitimation by churches and the state helped the effectiveness of King's nonviolent resistance movement that was aiming at destroying the social system that has euphemistically been called Jim Crow. Henceforth, it became a matter of moral virtue for many whites to march in support of civil rights for black Americans. Most outside the South considered King and his followers, courageous social change agents worthy of emulation, whose lot it was, regrettably, to suffer immensely, immensely at the hands of Bull Connor's dogs and hoses, of Sheriff Pritchard's whips and jailings, the bombings of houses and churches and schools, the brutal beatings of hundreds and hundreds, all of which produced many martyrs in that battle. Interestingly, those who advocated any form of violence 
even as a measure of self-defense. Right? Some of the younger people eventually became, became bored and disgruntled with simply placing their bodies on the line, so to speak, and constantly being beat. And they began saying, no, we're not going to do it any longer. We are not going to take the initiative to use violence, but if somebody hits, we're going to hit back. And that was contrary to Martin Luther King Jr., who grieved over that greatly and tried always to have the people committed to nonviolence regardless. And many of the people did that when they were in King's presence, simply because they couldn't bring themselves to the point of doing something contradictory to his wishes. But they and others like Malcolm X and, uh, and other groups were advocating violence as a matter of self-defense. <clears throat> they received, those groups, none of them received any legitimation whatsoever from the white society. And it was there as these other groups became more um, uh, uh, visible that the society at large was able to legitimate more and more the methods and the goals of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, there is the story of Malcolm X sitting on the platform on some occasion uh, beside Mrs. Uh, Coretta Scott King. And he, lean when Dr. King was speaking, Malcolm X leans over and says to Mrs. King, uh, America had better listen to your husband, or otherwise they are going to have to deal with me. And so what he was saying virtually is that the, the more that I, Malcolm X, speak out um, for the use of violence in self, as a self-defense mechanism, then the more that that is going to help Martin Luther King's cause to be realized. Clearly, whites were not disposed to fight another civil war in order to ensure the civil rights of black Americans. And black Americans generally knew that they were too small a minority to wage war independently. And hence, the Civil Rights Movement and its leader, Martin Luther King, Jr., enjoined the traditional art of moral suasion with the novel activity of nonviolent direct resistance in a most successful way. And I say it's a traditional art of moral suasion because that's the art that the churches had long used of approaching the authorities in small numbers with reasoned arguments and trying to appeal to their consciences in their offices and elsewhere in the society. But traditionally, they did not employ the, the activity of nonviolent uh, uh, direct resistance uh, on a mass scale. And uh, that took place in 1956 in Montgomery, and that was a novel experience. And something new happened, and that was joined together with the traditional um, mode of moral suasion, and that was a watershed for the race and for uh, the country as a whole. And that story itself spilled over into the Canadian situation because black Canadians uh, kept an eye 
on what was happening there and were inspired by those activities. Yet in the South, a generalized social consensus characterized the vast majority of whites relative to the quest for racial justice. In fact, the majority of Southern whites seemed to oppose virtually everything that characterized the thought and action of Martin Luther King, Jr. And like King and his followers, these also often appealed to both biblical and church traditions as religious and moral grounds for justifying their opposing position. The most obvious contemporary example of a simil similar stru struggle in the quest for racial justice is the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Unlike the American struggle, the opponents of constitutional apartheid can appeal to no legitimate authorities within the Republic of South Africa for either moral or legal support. As with every state, legitimation is derived from the law. Hence, anti-apartheid activities are rendered unlawful by the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, and especially when they are generated by those who have not been granted the franchise. Following his first visit to South Africa in 1985, James Cohn, the progenitor of the black theology movement and born and brought up in Arkansas, said that being in South Africa made him imagine what it would have been like for a black American to be in the South during the 1940s and the 1950s with no North. Um, what set the, the whole civil rights movement in, in motion in its form in the 1950s and the 1960s was the Supreme Court decision in 1954 regarding the desegregation of schools or outlawing uh, segregation in the public school system. And that sort of sent um, a legal wave of justification throughout the black community. Because if it was unlawful f to segregate in schools, then it should similarly be unlawful to segregate anywhere else in the society. And so that became a springboard uh, for the, um, the more recent uh, reform. So it came, the springboard came from outside of the southern states, but the southern states were part of the Union. In South Africa, with, the, with apartheid being the constitution of the republic, then it's, it's impossible from within the republic to get any justification for resistance to it. And so that's why James Cone says that to be there would have been like being in the South with no North. And that is a graphic description of one of the major differences between the two struggles. All moral and religious support for anti-apartheid movement from outside the country is devoid of legitimacy by the ruling elites. Hence the, I mean, it doesn't matter how much we talk about anti-apartheid, it is not legitimated within the country. Hence the latter, that is the ruling elites, consider all such people as enemies of their state and revolutionary in the form and aim of their protests. In South Africa, no appeal to either rational or religious sources can be effective 
in changing moral and religious perspectives on the issue of apartheid. As with similar stru stru struggles elsewhere, few con converts are made from either side to the other by persuasion alone. Even appeals to majority rule, that is one person, one vote, as a self-evident democratic principle can receive no credibility in a society that excludes the majority of the population from citizenship. Had the southern states been successful in seceding from the Union in the 1860s, and had they constituted themselves into a sovereign nation with a constitution legitimating racial segregation and discrimination, then the result would have been strikingly similar to present day the Republic of South Africa. The moral and religious problem evident in, the, in this comparison is that of conflict between moral and religious traditions. When religious and moral understandings between and among plural communities are diametrically opposed to one another, how can such a situation be effectively resolved? More specifically, in both South Africa and the United States, opposing racial groups appeal to common source materials, to the Bible and to their church traditions, to justify contradictory societal practices and procedures. That is, Christians on both sides of the struggle appeal to common source materials to justify their contradictory positions. Now, no attempt is made in this lecture to determine the original cause of either side's position. Suffice it to say that rigorous consistency of argument attends both sides of the conflict. And in each case, both positions can be argued either deductively, that is, beginning with theological position to social pr practice, or inductively, beginning from social practice and moving to theological position. I contend that neither side can gain the loyalty of the other side by moral and religious suasion alone. Other relevant resources must be engaged, and that these chiefly are and must be political. In the practical problem of social justice, I mean, so, sorry, if the practical problem of social justice cannot be solved by ethical and theological appeal alone, then on what agency should one rely for effective social change? I contend that parapolitical agency or voluntary associations I say parapolitical when I'm talking about voluntary associations with political aims. Not all voluntary associations have political aims. That these are the key to the answer that we seek. In other words, the issue of social justice must become a public issue with sufficient breadth of perspective, depth of thought, and mass appeal in order to effect the desired goal. What then are the basic conditions and capacities for such activity? Freedom of speech and of association are necessary conditions for the type of public debate and deliberation that is necessary. When these are denied, social change agents 
are forced to rely on illegal, clandestine activities that are aimed at radical changes in the societal structures. Radical goals may require radical means for their actualization, and more often than not, this has meant the use of violence. More moderate means of nonviolent resistance may often be effective in achieving moderate goals of social reform, as evidenced in Martin Luther King's Southern Strategies. As it did in Mahatma Gandhi's movement in India. Desire for broad-based association comprising a rich diversity of peoples and perspectives, sharing a common life is a primary indicator of human capacity to construct a viable, deliberate process for the continuous pursuit of that goal. You see, there have got to be a substantial group of people desiring the change and willing to undergo the risks and the suffering. Because every time you try to change any social system, it is naive to think that your activities will not be greeted with strong resistance. Because social structures are held in place by coercive forces and the threat of coercion. And that's why those who have maximum power in the society have a military and they have a police force that will do their bidding. And, and that is used, those forces are used to put down threats to the order, so that it is not a simple thing to go forth and to do battle against social structures and social systems. It is a costly thing. And if you provide no threat to them and simply provide services that maintain the system, um, then you will be praised by the system. Whenever a moral, religious, and or political conflict emerges between or among human communities, no lasting effective resolution can be had apart from the willingness of all relevant parties to negotiate a just end. Even if the groups should war against each other in a violent way, the final lasting goal can only be a mutually agreed upon just peace. Conquest alone can never lead to a just peace, but rather conquest alone leaves you with two perpetually alienated groups, the conquerors and the conquered. Why is the political quest for a community of diverse persons morally, religiously, and politically good? First of all, because humans have the capacity to transcend their natural communities of family and tribe by forging wider communities of belonging, not by the brute force of conquest, but by the persuasive art of design. In such activity, humans actualize a higher ac capacity, namely that of enhancing and expanding moral communities. By so doing, humans overcome those natural inclinations 
towards being content with narrow tribal and parochial experience. Resources abound in the Judeo-Christian tradition supportive of narrow tribal religion on the one hand. And therefore, one can look to the election of Israel as God's chosen people or the sectarian separation of the church from Judaism or the church from the world. And one can sort of make these the ground for parochial religious theologies and procedures. Or one can look to the supportive or the, those passages of scripture and tradition that are supportive of a more universal tradition and community. The Judeo-Christian God portrayed as creator of all, that is, and hence divine parent of all peoples, which imply kinship relations among all peoples. And one can use that kind and those kinds of universal motifs that are present in the Judeo-Christian tradition as resources for a broader and wider and more complex community of races and peoples. Every form of racism, tribalism, sexism, nationalism, classism among Christians have appealed selectively to biblical and ecclesiastical traditions. That is to say, they, they wrench the specificity of Jewish or Christian tribal relations from the universal divine relation and its implications for worldwide community among all peoples. And in so doing, they distort the Judeo-Christian tradition and advocate morally perverse social and political relations accordingly. Those who oppose the oppressive results of such narrow parochialisms by pressing for a broader community of belonging are, in my judgment, more faithful to the holism that is implicitly and explicitly evident in the Judeo-Christian tradition. But the opposition to all forms of external control and the thrust for the reform of social systems are set in motion by voluntary associations. This does not mean that reform cannot come from the top down. But whatever it does, it necessarily reflects more the values and interests of those on the top than those on the bottom. And this may not be totally bad by any means. In fact, it may well be, under many circumstances, a good beginning. And I think that the Glasnos um, event uh, is a good example of reform beginning from the top. And it is good. But change from the top down is rarely sufficient because the values and interests of those at the top and those at the bottom never coincide completely. Thank you very much for your attentiveness. Dr. Paris has agreed to handle any questions you might want to uh, put to him. If you uh, are afraid you will not be heard, there's a microphone standing in the aisle there. Okay. I don't think they can hear. <laughs> Sorry. 
I was wondering, Dr. Paris, uh, in the uh, Reconstruction period after the Civil War, how was it possible for the Southern states to impose those Jim Crow uh, laws? Were they acting on the, the principle of states' rights? Yes. Yes, that's the, uh, that's the answer. It was, um, uh, they, were, um, they were simply using their own legislatures, state legislatures, and making various laws. And it would take some years later, like a half century later, for sufficient um, activity and pressure to be brought on the Supreme Court of the United States to pass judgment on those state laws. A state um, can begin by, um, by legislating anything it wishes. The issue then is whether that, those laws are um, uh, consistent with the Constitution of the United States. But somebody has got to make the appeals through the court systems in order for uh, it to get to the Supreme Court. And it became very difficult and impossible for blacks to, um, to appeal because the judges were all part of the system and blacks did not sit on juries. And so there was no, um, no way of bringing it before the courts. Uh, the, it was only through the activities of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Peoples that they were finally able to bring a case that occurred outside of the South. Um, uh, it was the Board of Education versus uh, in, in Tampa, uh, um, Kansas. Uh, um, somebody, Brown versus the Board of Education. And this was uh, a case relevant to the issues of segregation in the schools, which the NAACP has spent many years looking for a case that could be a test case outside of the South. And then when the Supreme Court ruled in 1954 um, in, uh, uh, against segregation, then um, that could be, um, could be the, what was, was a clear demonstration. But then the, neither the government of the United States, the federal government, nor the state governments did anything about that ruling for another 20, 25 years. They didn't start desegregating the schools until they were forced to desegregate by, um, by what's been called force busing um, operations set in motion by the Supreme Court. Today, w we have a different Supreme Court in the sense that it is a very conservative court. And so this court if is, is about ready, in my judgment, to turn the clock back on several civil rights issues, uh, including um, the desegregation of schools because I'm sure that the issue of busing, when it comes to this Supreme Court, it will not, um, uh, it will not stand, uh, uh, withstand its present situation. Uh, yes. Um, I, th I don't know that I can go to the Middle East. <laughs> I don't know what I could say there in relationship to, because I don't have adequate experience or, um, or reading to know enough about the how voluntary associations uh, function uh, in those contexts. Um, I feel 
um, easier about African situations and uh, the United States and Canada. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't think I will venture to relate the issues of voluntary associations to that situation. Um, only to say, I think that you do have uh, even more complexity there because you have so many different religious traditions uh, that people up appeal to in different ways in order to maintain uh, certain kinds of, um, and certain forms of, um, of national parochialism. But I, um, I don't feel qualified to, to go any further on that question. Yes. Um, that is a, is a great question. Uh, uh, how do you uh, mobilize uh, people who maybe they have the feelings that something is wrong, but they, for various reasons, they don't think that they can do anything about it. Uh, they don't have the vision. And, uh, and I, I guess I don't think there's any one answer to that question. Um, I tend to feel that in many situations, however, the mobilization begins in very small groups. And it begins by exposing the people in these small groups to, um, uh, to a broader world of possibility. Um, hearing the stories of other people in other situations and that they can identify with or feel is not terribly alien from their own situation. I think that that can be very, very helpful. Um, uh, I think that uh, I feel that the use of films, and there are lots of documentary type things, um, uh, short films that focus on case studies of how various small communities uh, uh, went about doing something uh, that they felt in the beginning that they, they could not do. And at some point, they, they never dreamed that they would be able to, to do. And these don't always have to be success stories. So it's good to have some, uh, some stories where people have, were able to achieve goals. Because I think that, uh, that the process itself uh, um, invigorates and reinvigorates and energizes people and, and changes people, uh, even if they don't finally realize uh, the full goal. It's good to have uh, some very modest goals so that a group can experience some success that keeps it going. 
Um, so that's, um, that's part of what I, and, and the filming or the personal contacts or taking groups of people to another location where they can get away from their own situation and look at what people that they can identify with are doing somewhere else. All of this helps to uh, give them vision. And I think we all need vision. <laughs> and that's how, that's how we get it. And, um, and if we read or if we are readers and, um, and you can get people you know, it, it, uh, to, to read a story and to discuss a book or something, like that, that's a way of doing it as well. Bringing them into personal contact, filming or drama, uh, helps them to be drawn into the other world and to feel some of the things that the others in that world feel. It was, um, you see, the feminist movement and various other ethnic group movements uh, had their beginnings in the civil rights movement in the United States, where women were functioning, students and so forth, were functioning uh, in various ways of helping in that movement, undergoing many of the stresses and strains because not knowing that whether it was their movement or someone else's movement, but the kinds of values that were present there cause people to reflect on themselves and their own experience. And, uh, and, and all of the early feminists uh, were solidly connected with the civil rights movement. And, uh, and that happened in the 19th century as well. The, uh, the women's movement, the suffragette movement, uh, in, the, um, in the second half of the 19th century, the leadership there in its early form were strong, active members of the abolition movement to abolish slavery. And then later, racism crept into the, uh, the women's movement in the 19th century, unfortunately, and that's a story in itself, which sort of um, has affected the movement to some extent uh, in this century. Um, but I, so I think that Becoming connected in some way with other people who are trying and have tried to liberate themselves helps one to get a vision. Um, and I think there are lots of those stories around that could be, um, but I think that the leadership, uh, like yourself and myself and so forth, have got to uh, search out some of these these resources, and then bring our peoples uh, into uh, into contact with them. Yes. You spoke earlier about the uh, the eventual political recognition of the civil rights movement. Um, how do you go beyond that? I think that, that even though that political recognition is, has been achieved, I, you ha I think you have to go beyond that to a point where it's an individual recognition. I've been. Uh, I've had very limited experience in the, in the United States, but the one memory I do have is of, uh, I've, I walked into a restaurant and sat in a seat, and later on, uh, one of the waitresses came up and told me that I had taken the seat of a, of a black gentleman who wouldn't approach me and, and tell me that I had taken his seat because he was afraid because I was white. Um, when I said, then I said I was going to go over and apologize to him, and she told me I couldn't do that either, because there were other whites in the in the in the area who would then think that I had somehow been coerced into going over to talk to him. Um, that that was in uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, and when I when I later walked through a black neighborhood, it was like everybody looked at me with fear. Um, and I assumed simply because I was white. And I, I, I wasn't used to that, but that's something that sticks in my mind. And I think that we've got to, that there's got to be some way to, to, um, to get beyond the political recognition and, and so that uh, now, with, as you said, with the, uh, with the Supreme Court, they could start turning the clock back. But if the, if the individual recognition was there, that wouldn't be possible. How do, you, how do you get to the point where that individual recognition is there and doesn't allow 
the clocks to be turned back. Yeah. With great difficulty. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I think you're pointing to some of the, the problems that have been emerging all over the United States, particularly in universities, in various neighborhoods. I don't know whether you've heard about the Bensonhurst um, incident where a black uh, teenager comes into an all-white community and there is, um, uh, is killed by a group of white um, uh, uh, young people. And uh, that's happened um, several times now. And, and it's condemned by the law, of course, and uh, nobody uh, justifies it. But there are values that are deeply entrenched in the social uh, systems and in the family structures and uh, the, uh, that, that view strangers as, uh, as enemies or threats. Uh, in this particular case, I think uh, it was felt by the young people who killed the boy that uh, he was coming into their area in order to date one of their girls and uh, they were opposed to that. And, um, and it so happened that he was coming in in order to uh, purchase uh, a used car from a parking, from a car lot. It was all a very great tragedy. And, uh, but the values there are, um, were not just held by those, those few people who set themselves upon the other. The whole, the, the value of being hospitable to people who are different uh, from ourselves, racially different, religiously different, uh, different in terms of economic class, um, different gender. Um, uh, we have not learned how to do that very well. Uh, that is to be hospitable in the sense of affirming the dignity of these people and not viewing any as being subordinate to ourselves. Uh, because at the base, one, one will say that the, that the law is helpful and it is a necessary condition, but the law doesn't do everything. But on the other hand, that is not an argument against having the law. Um, I think that we, we need to have more uh, opportunities in small groups, again, for people to deal with uh, basic, fundamental human values. And I think that in so often in our educational system and so forth, we do not self-consciously uh, deal with that subject matter. It's dealt with sort of indirectly. Um, as it comes up in the relationships within the class and so forth, but it is, doesn't really become a subject matter for serious engagement. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Please. 
Well, I think you are pointing again to a very good issue. Um, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where I was in at Vanderbilt University for many years, uh, uh, towards the late 60s, just before I got there, uh, I think Stokely Carmichael came on the campus. He is an exponent of black power. And, uh, and large numbers of white students resisted his coming and protested against it. The university authorities and so forth uh, took a stand saying that the university should be open to hearing the opinions and viewpoints of all peoples, um, uh, regardless what their ideologies might be. And uh, so Stokely Carmichael was brought uh, to the campus with university support. Um, soon thereafter, a group of the more conservative students decided to invite the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan <laughs> to come to campus. And of course, the black students then all rose up in protest against that. And the uh, university took the stand that, um, that the university was a, an open forum and that um, the Grand Wizard could come. <laughs> and that the black students could protest and so forth that they wish, because that's part of the open forum as well, as long as they not disrupt the, the, um, uh, the, the actual um, uh, lecture. Um, it was agreed by the university in both cases that in order for the marks of an open forum to be present, that, um, that there should be respondents to each of the speakers so that when the Grand Wizard spoke, then there would be somebody to respond. Uh, the difficulty there was that uh, no black would respond, <laughs> uh, simply because that was just too much. It wasn't worth uh, our, our doing that. And so I think some whites uh, eventually uh, um, uh, responded, and uh, blacks simply uh, carried protest signs and so forth outside the building. Now that's a different sort of thing. And, and while I'd rather not see the Grand Wizard come on campus and so forth, um, I, um, or anyone else from the Ku Klux Klan, uh, I do tend to support that kind of um, open forum. But that is different from uh, two other things. One, the, um, the kinds of slander that has been taking place in university contexts in the United States, where there would be, say, a banner put up on a certain building that uses racial epithets and says nasty things about blacks or about Jews or about some other ethnic group or about women. And um, uh, that is um, that is a tax. It's vicious attacking. And, uh, and it needs to be condemned, I think, by all of the forces of, of law and, um, and, and penalties and so forth, and punishments, or some sorts of thing. In order for us to be a civil community, we don't sort of write these kinds of things and graffiti and stuff like that that, that abuse other people. Um, that's one example, I think, which is different. Another example which is different is, um, um, is again at Vanderbilt University at the time one year when the Davis Cup uh, games were invited by the athletic department uh, to, um, to be held at Vanderbilt. And the South Africa Tennis Association um, was, was, was going to be playing, and they were a part of, of the Davis Cup. And so all of us protested that event, um, saying that the university should um, not invite South Africans um, who are, in this case, uh, sponsored by the South African government uh, to come to the campus. The university argued that this was again under the rubrics of open forum. And uh, we argued that there was no open forum at a tennis match. Um, and then that a tennis match could not be construed as an open forum. <laughs> and so then the university argued uh, 
that um, they would have the university chaplain um, arrange for a discussion <laughs> of um, the issues while the, um, the Davis Cup was being played. And of course, uh, it meant that, uh, that nobody was going to be there discussing because people were either going to be watching the tennis match or they would be joining the rest of us in, um, in, a, in a demonstration uh, outside. And, uh, and so we lost that battle, but I still contend that a tennis match is not the same as, uh, as an open forum. Uh, the, um, and then finally, there's, um, I think all of this is different from in Nashville, Tennessee, again, uh, the Christmas um, uh, parade. Every year they have a big Christmas parade at Thanksgiving and so forth. And, uh, and Santa Claus comes at the end of the whole parade. Well, on this particular year, the Ku Klux Klan wanted to be an honor guard for Santa Claus, <laughs> which I thought was a bit gross, <laughs> and everybody else thought was a bit gross. And so um, uh, the question was, could the Ku Klux Klan march in the parade? It was finally decided, well, reluctantly, um, they could march, but um, as a group like everyone else, but uh, the police had to be on guard to make sure that they not march alongside of Santa Claus's sleigh, <laughs> because that would be giving an indication that this was, in fact, a Ku Klux Klan uh, affair. Uh, so these things are not pristine, uh, and I, um, uh, I appreciate the sensitivity that you uh, sh indicate, because I like to sort of see all groups speaking in public and being given visibility whose values and so forth agree with mine. But on the other hand, I think that I do need to, uh, to allow people to speak as long as they speak civilly and rationally about their own position, even if it radically disagrees with my own. I think that if Adolf Hitler were invited to the campus to speak, then I think, I would hope that that wouldn't happen, and I think I might even resign <laughs> under that circumstance, given the kind of power and so forth that such a person might have over the lives of so many people. But then again, that would be my choice and uh, decision. Yes? I just wanted to raise a perhaps a bit more of a pragmatic issue. For many voluntary associations, it seems to me one of the key issues is funding. Um, uh, any experience I've had with groups that are strictly volunteer uh, illustrates to me that they tend to run into problems. They tend to go for a while and do very well, but without the sustained uh, funding and uh, the capacity for staff resources, they tend to be somewhat less than effective. You used the example of the NAACP, and as you're quite well aware, to sustain those sorts of legal challenges in court requires a great deal of funding sure. and a great deal of expertise. Yes. One of the uh, paradoxes that I see, particularly for groups that are disenfranchised uh, and, uh, and who require empowerment, uh, is that they very often seek funding from government and other establishment organizations, uh, which, which I think in some sense may compromise their capacity to be effective critics and proponents for change. Uh, and it's that paradox, I guess, that I'd like you to comment on uh, from your experience. Uh, how do groups get around the fact that if they're going to be effective, they're going to perhaps need staff support they're going to have staff support, they're going to need funding, and very often that funding may in fact come from government, the very people who may be the opponents of, of uh, real effective change. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, you, you've laid out the issues very well, and that is uh, a major problem for all voluntary associations, is, is the nature of their capacities and they all need some kinds of economic capacities depending upon their, uh, their goals, they need more or less. And sometimes they just, and often, they just are not able to, um, to do a lot of things that they would like to do simply because they don't have the capacity, the economic capacity or some other capacity. 
Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. spent an enormous amount of time uh, simply traveling around the country uh, giving speeches um, and telling the story of what uh, his movement was, was about. And this was in order to, um, to raise monies. Uh, he would be uh, giving three and four speeches a day, seven days a week, uh, often, uh, by various support groups organized all over the country and so forth to raise money to help support the movement. Uh, practically every penny of the money that was raised went directly into the, um, uh, the, 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 um, the coffers of SCLC. Uh, took bail people out of jail and, and all of that. In our church in Nashville, Tennessee, I was not there then, but, um, but many people in the church mortgaged their, took second mortgages on their homes in order to bail people out of jail and to pay uh, the fees for lawyers and so forth. Many cases, lawyers gave of their time and so forth freely, but there's only a certain extent to which they can do that. But you see, there has to be uh, someone who can capture the imagination of the peoples and really motivate them and show that the values that are being striven for are the values that they, um, that they can uh, support. And if you can't mobilize people to do that, then you just, um, you just can't. The um, uh, organizations that, that appeal to, um, to foundations for monies and to government agencies for monies, then their goals and purposes must be aligned with the goals and purposes of those funding agencies. And if that's the case, then they might get funded, and that helps. But it means that as soon as they step out of line uh, at the level of principle of whatever, then they do run the threat of losing their financial base. This is a problem in, um, in churches, for instance, that are voluntary by and large, is that if the church does something that offends the sensitivities of some of the members of the congregation, then the members of the congregation withdraw their support. And so clergy are constantly have one eye on their um, financial support base. And that serves as a constraining factor. It's okay if they're not doing anything controversial. Uh, it never comes up, it never becomes an issue. But as soon as some controversy arises, then the leadership has really got to look seriously at institutional maintenance needs versus moral compunctions and so forth um, uh, to go in certain directions. So in short, voluntary associations are very fragile and they can be weak and so forth. There's also, uh, and they can die, and probably more voluntary associations die than live. There's also, which I didn't really talk about very much, the whole area of coalitions, which I also think are very, very important for certain kinds of causes and lots of causes, it's for all kinds of organizations to form coalitions of support. And those also are very fragile things that are held together temporarily and, and often can be very necessary things to. I just wanted to raise one supplementary issue to that. I think you ended your, your talk with, with the, kind of the dichotomy between those in power and those who, who, who are out of power or, yes. or disenfranchised.